Hello and welcome aboard this 1960 Caravelle jet, the first short haul jet airliner ever built. My name is Nils Algren, I've been a commercial pilot for 15 years and as much as I appreciate flying the Airbus, and particularly the A340 which I think is a fantastic airplane, my true passion is for these first generation jets with game gauges, very little automation and true hands-on feeling. This is why I've spent four years of my life restoring this cockpit into a fully functional flight simulator. And today I would like to show you some of the special features of this airplane and talk to you about the procedures that are very different to what we're doing nowadays. The first thing that really stands out is the arrangement of the cockpit windows. And it's a myth that the Caraval has the same nose section as the de Havilland Comet. It's simply not true because Sud-Est and later Sud Aviation had to redesign these windows and reinforce them after the Comet accidents. But for the pilot, it's pretty annoying having that strut right in front of you. And in general, the visibility is pretty bad. And later models of the Caravel had bigger windows and improved visibility. But these small and strong windows definitely keep the birds out. Balls of dead poultry held at over 500 miles per hour. The Caravel 3 was usually operated with a flight engineer. Technically, he wasn't required, but many pilot unions back in the day insisted on having the flight engineer on board. And this results in many different configurations and layouts and the one that stands out on this particular fleet, on the Air France Caravelle fleet, is that all radios are on the overhead panel. It's very unusual and I can tell you it's very uncomfortable too. Another thing, the gear lever placed on the pedestal instead of the pilot's panel. Um, but just look at the, uh, the flight engineer's panel. It's very basic and actually there wasn't really much for him to do except reading checklists and, and um, monitoring the systems. So by placing the gear lever on the pedestal, that uh, gave him something to do. The panel layout is pretty standard. You have the airspeed indicator on the left. It's a bit difficult to read. The double pointer, double needle. The same used on the de Havilland Comet 1. Attitude indicator, Sperry HZ4. It's the older version that has a black sphere, making it a bit difficult to recover from an upset situation particularly at night and a standard altimeter uh, that's a later model early caravels had a uh, Coltsman and on the right the vertical speed and below the uh, below the attitude indicator you have the RMI so you have the basic T and on the left you have the PDI pictorial deviation indicator for the VOR and ILS You have the radio altimeter, it's pretty neat, you can change the scale up to 5,000 feet and you can turn it off and VOR, RMI and you have one DME only, one DME indicator only on the DME number two and that's the, stand, the um, standby horizon. You have the air sp um, speed brake indicator lights, the marker lights and the minima light. This one is for the minima. And you can select it down there on the left side. Select the minima and the light goes on when you go below that minima. Stopwatch and G meter on the left side. And these are the autopilot trim indicators. On the engine side on the Rolls-Royce powered caravel is pretty interesting because it can only be done using electrical power, no bleed air. There are two ways of starting the engines. One is using external power, 112 volt DC, which is very unusual, or by using the batteries, by connecting some batteries, not all of them, in series. Battery start was always avoided whenever possible because it's really hot on the batteries, they get really hot, and whenever you did a battery start, you would have to write it down to the technical logbook. I'm gonna demonstrate your engine start very quick. It's very simple. And one interesting thing about the engine start and by reading and going through the checklist is right after you've started the first engine and you have hydraulic pressure, you would extend the flaps to 10 degrees. Initially, even in the early 60s, it was 20 degrees, but later during the uh, caravel operations in France, at least, that's what I know, it was 10 degrees. And you will probably never see uh, caravel taxiing on, on old video footages or photos with flaps retracted because it was, was a requirement to extend the flaps 
to protect the engines from FOD. So the engine start on the Caravel is pretty simple and it's almost like the Airbus. You have démarrage ventilation, démarrage is start and ventilation is crank. So, démarrage. You choose the engine, left or right, gauche et droite. It's interesting they're saying left and right. Today you're always saying one and two. So left engine and then you press the start button. These are the igniters. We have the RPM rising. And in reaching 800 RPM, you would add the fuel. DGT rising. Pretty simple. Same for the right one. Now if you add the fuel too early, you will definitely get a hot start. interesting noise you will be hearing all the time in the background is the combustible consommé, the fuel used indicator. Every click is one kilogram of fuel used and every Caravelle 3 pilot remembers this very distinctive sound. And obviously if you, when you add when you add the power, add fuel, you can hear how much fuel it consumes. The Kerbal 3 wasn't particularly quiet during ground operation. Two fans had to be kept running continuously on the ground. One is the ventilation anti buée that's the defog fan. It blows air into the tubes. And these four windows are electrically heated, they don't need it. And there's another fan. Ventilation mur. This one sucks out the warm air from the avionics racks and blows it out. Once you got airborne, you can turn them off. But they have to be running on the ground. So that's the standard noise level on the ground of the caravan. An interesting aspect of the Caraval 3 is the lack of reverse thrust. It's a bit unusual touching down, not having your reverse thrust levers but we have a braking chute and you would use that one in uh, case of an emergency, aboard a takeoff and runway is shorter than 1800 meters dry or 2200 meters wet and you would have to inform ATC before using it according to the book and you would simply pull it back, keep it extended even during taxi in the case of a strong crosswind during taxi you would increase engine power to keep the chute straight and just before reaching the parking position you would push it in and that would disconnect the chute from the airplane and somebody would have to go pick it up and put it back into the box. Usually you would have a spare chute in the box and container but that depended on the uh, destination. Here we have the low pressure fuel cocks they are called, commonly thought of being reverse thrust but they are for the fuel and they're red because they're only used in case of engine fire and they would simply shut off the fuel to the engine. That's why we don't have any fire handles on the Carol 3 because everything would have to be done manually. That is, shut off the fuel, shut off the hydraulics, shut off the bleed. And when you talk to all flight engineers of the Caraval, they still know all this by heart because it was a memory item. What else? We have the, yeah, the um, speed brake, very effective. Push it down, pull it back. It's not proportional like on the Boeing or the Airbus, it's on or off. And extended, it could really make you fall out of the sky. Um, Passengers don't have any oxygen masks. I'm going to show you on the uh, safety uh, safety card. Because within two or uh, two and a half minutes, you could ascend to altitudes where you could breathe. Highly effective, and you could 
You would even increase the effectiveness by doing a 30 degree bank angle turn. Some say 90 degrees, I better think that's only when there are no passengers on board. And here we have a G meter and during emergency descent, speed brakes and you push the nose down to uh, 0 0.5 G. Yes, and this is the parking brake. Very simple. Pull it back, parking brake set. It has different different notches depending on how strong you want it to be set. Now the seats, uh, same as on the Super Constellation, and I think even more comfortable than the, the Airbus. And very nice recline. Very good for a napping procedure. Excellent seats compared to the flight engineer seat and the um, observer seat, which are extremely uncomfortable. Now, cooling was a major issue on the Carol 3, and if temperatures in the cockpit went above 30 degrees centigrade, you had to remove all those covers. And the little hatch, porte avril en vol, that little hatch has to be open during flight. Now there's one thing I do not really like on this airplane, that's the layout of the rudder pedals and the brakes, the, the foot brakes. Press them only like half an inch and you have full braking power. And that has nothing to do with the simulator, that's the way it was. The warning horns on the Caravelle are actually not from an airplane, they're actually from cars, from Citroën cars. The overspeed warning and the stall warning and well that's the standard your food is ready restaurant time and there's another thing i noticed during the restoration you have to look for yourself i'm not going to comment on it as you've probably noticed these control columns come from the de Havilland comet they're exactly the same and they do not have any pitch trim switches. So pitch trim is done manually using these wheels. And it's very interesting, by turning these wheels, you're not acting on a THS, you're actually changing the neutral position of the actual elevator. It's a very unusual system. So takeoff on the Caraval 3 is pretty interesting because the first thing you need to do is to calculate the time to accelerate to 100 knots. And the reason is because we do not have a real engine power indicator except the RPM and the fuel flow. So you take the time to confirm the correct acceleration. It's usually around 23, 24 seconds. Always standing takeoff and there's no D-rate there's no flex, it's always full power, which is 8,050 or 8,100. 8,100 is definitely the maximum RPM for takeoff. So you increase the thrust, and you see the green lights coming on. They come on at a certain RPM between max continuous and full power. And these two position nozzle flaps, they are called, these flaps decrease the nozzle area and increase the velocity of the exhaust gases and this equals a slight thrust increase of about 5% or 500 to 1000 pounds and then you release the brakes and at the same time you start the timing Knots is passed, time is checked. And we want to rotate. And now you're not concentrating on pitch, you're actually concentrating on your vertical speed. Apply the brakes, gear up, 
Now you're keeping 1,000 feet per minute climb rate. You could even go below that with ATC clearance. And the whole idea behind that is to, to accelerate as quickly as possible to 250 knots. So when passing 400 feet, flaps up. You keep accelerating. Said climb power, which is 7,700. See the flaps are open now. Nozzle flaps. And you keep accelerating to 250 knots. And once you reach the 250 knots, you would ignore the rate of climb indicator and you're climbing at 250 knots. That's standard takeoff procedure on the Caravelle. There were actually noise abatement procedures like E2 plus 10 climb for London and other airports. So, but this is standard procedure. That's why you see a lot of shallow climbs, climb angles and the curve of free. I really like the autopilot on this airplane. It's very simple and yet effective. Turning it on, pretty not much. The green light means all systems are go. Pre engagé, it's ready to connect. And you press engage. And I'll just hold. Now it keeps the heading and keeps the altitude. And I'll turn now done using this knob. And that's like a 30 degree bank. It's pretty neat. It's very ergonomic. Very nice to handle. I really like it. Up and down is used using this push button. It has two clicks really. One degree or two degrees per second, and works pretty well. Now, there's one thing on the Carol 3 that really makes you wonder what were they thinking? The cabin wall made out of wood, the batteries placed right next to the oxygen bottle. That's just an accident waiting to happen. And we know Murphy's Law, and you can imagine it did happen. En fait, à l'époque, on n'avait pas de simulateur. On avait des simulateurs, mais qui étaient fixes. C'était maintenant, on appellerait ça, je ne sais pas comment, mais des, des, des traîneurs, des, enfin, on n'avait pas, pas de simulateur. Donc, on était pour qualifier nos pilotes, on était obligé de leur faire une démonstration, et eux-mêmes, euh, ils essayaient de récupérer l'avion, de décrochage sur l'avion lui-même. En live. Ce qui fait, voilà, ce qui mmh. fait qu'on montait aux alentours de 36 000, 40 000 pieds, le plus haut possible, ce qui était très haut. Et là, on attendait... Alors, si besoin, on réduisait un petit peu et on attendait le décrochage. Le décrochage arrivait en général par l'aile droite, par du bufting. C'est un bufting, c'est un tremblement de l'aile. Tac, 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 tac. Et, et l'avion, tac, partait, décroché. Et là, bon, pour le récupérer, il fallait, au contraire de ce qu'on a envie de faire, c'est-à-dire de garder l'altitude, il ne faut surtout pas la garder. Il faut, il faut aller chercher la vitesse. Voilà. Et une fois qu'on a la vitesse et qu'elle commence à arriver, il ne faut pas qu'elle aille trop loin pour ne pas avoir le bufting haute vitesse, ce qui est là beaucoup plus grave, hein. enfin, vous connaissez ça. Et on se récupérait aux alentours de 15 000 pieds. Donc on perdait 20-25 000 pieds dans l'exercice. Des choses qu'aujourd'hui on ne pourrait plus voir, parce que pour la cause de la certification, 
si je vais dans les croisières, là, dans la, euh, si je vais dans les toilettes, je fais bouger ici les manettes de gaz. Alors c'était une de nos plaisanteries favorites en entraînement, pour réduire les moteurs, on allait derrière, puis pour, pour faire une pause, simuler des pannes pour les stagiaires. <rire> ah c'est rigolo à voir. Hein. Ah ouais, c'est assez étonnant. Voilà, ça te fait bouger. <rire> c'est incroyable. Hein. Ouais. Et, et c'était pas du tout sécurisé. Hein. C'était comme ça, tu vois, deux petits trucs. <rire> Now, I consider myself really fortunate to own this amazing piece of aviation history. Not only because the Caravel is such a beautiful airplane, but also because I have a personal relationship to Poitou. Her mother was a flight attendant for Air France, BEA and Lufthansa later on, but she started her career with Air France as a flight attendant, and she actually worked on this airplane. And Poitou is also a movie star. It has been used in several movies throughout its career, in music videos, And probably one of the most exciting story is that the Beatles actually flew on this particular aircraft in June 1964 from Manchester to Paris, and that I found the boarding pass of John Lennon. While I was restoring the cabin, I found this gold ring. I talked to a lot of Carolla pilots, and they all said it was a wonderful airplane to fly, very easy. And, and very forgiving airplane as well. And many 707 pilots considered caravan pilots bad pilots because it was so easy to fly. It's a true story. We're missing on the caravan three spoilers. So up on touchdown, we'd be using speed brakes, but uh, speed brakes don't have the same effect as spoilers. So the aircraft tends to bounce, and we have longer landing run. So when approaching 50 feet above the threshold. Close the throttles, don't do that on the Airbus. So after touchdown, put the nose on the runway. You wouldn't apply brakes immediately unless obviously you had to. The flight engineer would be calling out the brake pressure. And when reaching 80 knots, you can apply full braking pressure. Such a cool airplane, I love it. Now I must admit, as much as I love the Caravel, I also love the Boeing 707. These two airplanes, I think the most beautiful airplanes ever to fly. And I consider myself very fortunate, again, to own this Boeing 707 cockpit. And I was able to locate all the interior parts, panels, all the panels, drums, covers, control columns, flight instruments, you name it, of a Lufthansa Boeing 707, Uniform Delta. And both my parents worked on Uniform Delta. My mother is a flight attendant and my father is a pilot. My father did, did his entire flight training on Uniform Delta in Roswell, New Mexico. So again, I have a personal relationship to the restoration project I'm doing, which I think is very important. These kind of projects are very complex and they require a lot of time, patience and money. Very often you get to a point where you see little to no progress, which can be very frustrating. The love for the airplane you're restoring and the personal relationship are the ultimate key to success to build the perfect flight simulator that mimics the real thing in every detail. I did restore a Mirage fighter jet cockpit and turned it into a flight simulator. Though it was a nice project, I never had the same passion and love for it as with the Caravelle or Boeing 707 and quickly sold the simulator again. This 707 project will have even more details than the Caravan and become a fantastic time machine, a living piece of aviation history. As you can see, it's still a long way ahead. I need to reconnect about 200 gauges, indicators, flags, and hundreds of switches and, and indicator lights and circuit breakers. I want all the systems to be working, even the cabin pressure controller. And engine model is very, very important with this airplane. Engine sound, obviously. So I think it's best sound ever. Uh, stuck reverses, slow engine speed up, all this, all this has to be spot on, pitch power values. With all the experience I gained throughout the restoration, 
further. I think it can be done. It's a massive problem. But it can be done. And there are always questions that pop up here and there. It can only be answered by people actually working on the 707 that is still current, still flying it regularly. So in case you're a flight engineer, pilot and working on this airplane, and you'd like to help me answering questions, maybe doing some recording from the iPhone, just a few seconds usually is enough. I would highly appreciate your help. And down there is a list. You can contact me there and it's a list of what I need. And yeah, I would highly appreciate your help. Thank you.